So for the first speaker now here on the stage, I'm very, very excited to ask Rainer Ratnik, who is the Baltic COO and attorney at the law at uh, Wide and Legal. And he is going to talk about ethical and legal aspects as part of cybersecurity. So go have a little fun. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Rainer. So uh, we are having a panel discussion uh, as the biggest part of this session. And to kick it off, uh, me and Henry, we're going to do uh, two short presentations, uh, which are essentially the first cornerstones for the discussion, because the rule is that law should be explained in simple terms, because otherwise it's only for lawyers, but we need a wider discussion. So two short presentations. My first presentation is about white hat slash ethical hacking. So uh, the reason I more or less uh, I'm able to talk about this topic is uh, because my, my background as a lawyer, uh, I've been working in the law firm setting for seven years. Uh, also, uh, I've been four and a half years in software. Uh, so my view on those topics is I'd say more practical, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, responsible disclosure and so forth. So I, I actually have written such policies on my myself and and see it from that perspective. So, white hat hacking. What is it? Uh, the general uh, description and the definition seems to be that everybody says that it's a ethical security hacker, and the ethical part means that the intent is to help. Uh, but there's a paradox, because the intent uh, will be understood not before the event where it's going to be, somebody's going to get hacked, but after, because we don't know after the fact what will be the real implication. So the question to ask to make it simpler is, if Robin Hood, the king of thieves, stole uh, fro for, from the rich and gave to the poor, did he ever leave some stolen gold for his own good? So what, what is specifically, uh, what does make the intent ethical or not unethical? So let's have a different scenario here. Uh, Robin Hood steals a cigarette from a smoker, does it make it ethical stealing? Everybody would say, would say, no, it doesn't. Because even though smoking is bad, we still have the presumption that you should not take somebody's things away. And also, Robin Hood, hero for some, but a criminal for others. So the general misunderstanding about ethical hand hacking is that uh, people think that if something is ethical, therefore it is legal. But the problem here is that this is the really, really wrong starting point for solving this puzzle. Because uh, when we look at the law, then the law actually doesn't differentiate based on intent, but rather from the perspective of the ground. So if we ask the question, does criminal law differentiate between hacking and ethical hacking, or hacking and hacking? The answer is, short answer is no. But the long answer is that without the ground, uh, if, if we have a ground for hacking, like a contract, consent, or the law, then ethical hacking actually becomes ethical. So the question actually isn't, the term the, the, about the term ethical, the question is rather about if there is a ground. So in a wider scope of uh, what does the law say, not going into too deep there, is that uh, the criminal law thinks about and asks about the consequence. Uh, and there are several grounds where you can uh, you can be charged and also, in some cases, already preparing for hacking is a criminal offense. 
And there are practical examples just from this year. There was a 14-year-old kid who hacked into a system, stole some data. Uh, the prosecutor's office was really kind and decided not to push too heavy. However, the problem is that the civil liability still stands. So, is there a practical problem? Yes, uh, because the general understanding that ethical hacking arises from the intent, I didn't want to do anything bad with those, those, uh, those accesses that I got, but the problem is that you need a ground. So, if you take one thing away from this presentation, uh, then it is that intention is irrelevant, ground is relevant. So what is the ground? Uh, it's a, usually in a form of a consent or a contract. Uh, and uh, the most usual example is a bug bounty program or responsible disclosure. Uh, so what does it mean? So if you are a ethical hacker or white hat hacker, you find out some bugs, get paid for it. Uh, companies publish such programs on their websites. You can find them easily. Also, uh, what's quite common that I've seen myself as well is that hackers reach out, ask, hey guys, do you have a bug, bug bounty program? Yes or no? And then something may, might happen, something good even. And there are platforms about bounty programs, so you can go and discover perhaps even thousands of opportunities. So if one needs to hack and wants to hack because this is a for, form of self-expression, then there are ways to do it with grounds. This means ethically and uh, enjoy life. So how does a bug bounty program in practical terms work? Uh, you, as a hacker, find out that there is a program then you review the terms of the program because it's really important that there usually are exclusions that say you cannot do this, this, and this. Uh, DDoS is the most uh, common, uh, what you see everywhere. Uh, and you find weaknesses and then you might even get paid. So the wider question of this whole event for this uh, panel is what should we teach about the youth about these topics. And these are the key takeaways. First, intention doesn't make anything ethical. Second, hacking without a legal ground, consent, contract, is a ground for, as a, it's a criminal offense and ground for civil liability as well. You might be, get, you might be sued in the civil court, claim damages, so forth. There are bug bounty programs that you can use, and when you use them, you must read the terms. Uh, if there is no program available, just send an email, ask. It might not be public. And also, as a general question, should we change the law? And this is more relevant for the panel. What we could do is we could theoretically change the criminal law and not publish underage hackers. However, this doesn't exclude civil liability, which, which might be even a bigger problem. Uh, also, what is next then? Shall we allow underage people to steal and allow physical violence? I guess no. We could have governmental bug bounty programs for the states. In Estonia, at least two years ago, we had one, which is good. I don't know if it's still there, but really, really good. This should be done everywhere. And we also could create like best, best practice uh, bug bounty programs published for the general public and companies to use. So this is all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, let's connect and giving this over to Annette. 
Um, so uh, I, I do already have the questions. Uh, once again, uh, now you should have a little bit more energy after the lunch break. Uh, I, I, I can tell that people actually have a little more energy, so we already have received some questions as well. Um, so I'm going to take the first one over here as well. Uh, so uh, what ethical guidelines should white hat hackers follow to avoid any kind of legal issues in the future? You must have a legal ground for accessing the system you're accessing. That's a very concrete answer. I mean, again, t again, talking to a person that comes from the law sector, so so that's kind of uh, uh, clear. So, what are the uh, what are some of the high-profile legal cases involving white hat hackers, and what can we learn from these? Uh, I showed just one uh, this uh, this uh, in this presentation, but uh, when I talked about this presentation with with my colleague. Uh, Gregory Palm, and then he, he said that, yes, this is a really practical program. Whenever I go to uh, the police station, I see a bunch of uh, gentlemen who look like hackers, and I'm <laughs> pre presuming that they are hackers, and so this is really practical. I guess uh, these are not most prominent cases, and the, when, when, when people in Estonia get caught for doing stuff in Estonia, the biggest cases are cross-border, huge hacks, uh, and uh, in those cases, this is a different, a different uh, story altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, but in practical terms, it's a really day-to-day -day business. So it's especially if you are a young hacker, just learning, perhaps don't know how to do it all super properly and well, so might get caught. All right, let's take the last one over here. Uh, so if you could give one of the recommendations to you, uh, let's say, because we also have people here from private sector. So how can these organizations ensure that their white hat hacking activities comply with the laws and regulations? So one of the recommendations, because we have like one minute. <laughs> uh, one recommendation is that when you are creating a bug bounty, bounty, bounty program, then please consult a data protection lawyer because uh, it's uh, what you're publishing essentially is a contract. You must uh, think it through. This is not a thing that a, a like a IT person would, would understand fully because there are terms that you need to add. Just copy pasting from somebody else might not do the trick, especially when you're copy pasting from the US. In Estonia, you would have to add also a data processing addendum and so forth, so you must be smart. But if you do it properly, it will be there serving you for years. All right, then thank you very much. A big round of applause to Rainer.